Hello, and welcome to today's installment of the Merchant Acquirers Committee, MAC and Venable Payments Law Virtual Bootcamp. This is our third day of covering a legal and regulatory topic of relevance for the payments industry. And today, we will be discussing federal and state law enforcement scrutiny of the payments industry. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank Mac for helping to organize this week-long series of webinars and to remind everyone that we have a webinar tomorrow at the same time addressing international issues and payments with speakers uh, from the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. who can discuss kind of some of the legal and regulatory issues of relevance in each of those jurisdictions. And then we have our last webinar on Friday addressing what's next in payments, which will include a look at some of the newest developments uh, in payments, both from a technology as well as legal and regulatory perspective. My name is Andrew Biggert, and I'm joined today by my eventable colleagues, Ellen Burge and Len Gordon. Uh, Len, unfortunately, can only join by audio today and um, because of some technical issues. And so also just to make a quick warning, you know, this is uh, uh, the type of situation where uh, any of us could drop, um, and hopefully we don't. But Please bear with us if we do have any uh, IT issues as we go along. All three of us are part of Venable's regulatory and financial services practice, where we advise sponsor banks, payment processors, payment facilitators, and other companies on various legal and regulatory issues on a daily basis. Our topic for today is federal and state law enforcement scrutiny of payments. Um, the payments industry has often uh, been a target of federal and state uh, law enforcement uh, regulators, and we really expect that to continue, particularly in the aftermath of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the economic challenges that are likely to follow and, and continue. In fact, in some ways, it seems like this area has actually heated up. Just in the past month or so, there's been two significant FTC enforcement actions that have been announced involving payments companies, and there was actually even a third one that was announced just yesterday. And so we will make sure that we cover all of those uh, in detail during this presentation. Um, in general, the goal is to, to give you an overview of the consumer protection and law enforcement risks and payments, explain why and how they may be changing um, uh, in response to COVID and, and other developments, provide an update on the enforcement environment and some best practices uh, to keep in mind as you move forward. Uh, that's a lot to cover in one presentation, but fortunately we have uh, Len and Ellen here who can um, guide us through these different topics. Um, we do have a detailed PowerPoint uh, that we're, we can use um, and that you guys should have uh, access to as a resource. Uh, but mostly we're gonna try to focus on kind of a Q&A roundtable discussion. So while the discussion will generally track what's in the PowerPoint, we're also going to be having a little bit more of a, kind of a roundtable conversation. Also, please keep in mind that you can earn CLE credit for this and we will provide uh, the code halfway through the presentation. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get moving to discussing um, some of the consumer protection um, and law enforcement basics uh, when it comes to payments. And Len, given your background as a regional director at the FTC, uh, could you maybe get this all started with an overview of why uh, federal and state regulators um, have targeted the payment industry in the past? Sure, H happy to do so, Andrew, thank you. And, and welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining. So I grew up in a little beach town at the south end of the Jersey Shore called Wildwood, New Jersey. Had a fabulous boardwalk, a couple mile long boardwalk, lots of arcades, pizza shops, rides, all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I loved to do when I was a kid was play arcade games. And one of my favorites was a game called Whack-A-Mole, where you got this big mallet and moles or other rodents would pop up and you slam them in the head and you scored points by how many you hit. That's how the FTC frequently feels when they're chasing um, what they would call fraudsters, people who are selling uh, bogus nutraceuticals, sham weight loss claims, uh, sham business opportunities, things like that. So the thought at the FTC for the last 10 years or so, and it comes and goes in waves depending on conduct, but is that one of the more efficient ways to challenge that kind of conduct and to stop that kind of conduct is to apply pressure at choke points. One of the choke points is processing. If the processors um, know that they might be held liable for processing for certain bad, in, in quotes, uh, merchants, those processors will, I mean, those merchants will have a harder time getting processing, 
there will be less consumer injury. It's a, it's a, you can, by going after a merchant, perhaps cut off tens, if not more, of, of merchants as opposed to doing it one at a time in, in a whack-a-mole game. So that's the, the, the theory. That's the reason behind it. You see it applied also to uh, currently VOIP providers where the FTC is, is going after them. It's the same notion to try and cut off really the oxygen in which these uh, alleged fraudsters breed. That's that's the legal theory and really the, the, the strategy behind the, the FTC's approach. Great. Um, and Ellen, you, you spent a lot of time in your practice defending uh, payments companies um, in, in government investigations. Could you maybe give us an overview, both at kind of the federal and state level, you know, building on what Len was discussing, what are the different agencies um, or state regulators that, that the payments industry needs to be aware of? Sure. Um, there's quite a few. So, um, and, it, and sometimes it depends on what type of a business you are. Um, we've talked about the Federal Trade Commission, um, the, also the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, very important to consider that. They were very active with payments cases especially earlier in their days. Um, I would expect them to, to come back on that zone in some ways, um, especially when the, um, the, the, the underlying merchant conduct at, at issue that, that the company is processing for is a consumer financial service. Um, the, the Department of Justice has been very active in this area. Um, we've seen um, plenty of interest there, even as, as you know, many of you have probably received subpoena requests, grand jury subpoenas, asking for information about merchants um, that you might have processed for, where there's some suspected criminal activity, like bank fraud or wire fraud. Those are simply to a bank or sending, uh, the, you know, untruthful information across um, to open a, a processing account. Um, if you're a bank, you're not regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, but you do have your bank regulator, and we often see um, an FTC case um, involving a merchant, the processor, maybe an ISO or a sales agent, and then separately, um, a sponsor bank could be involved or a, a bank, the bank partner could be involved through a side action that is filed by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency or some other bank regulator. So um, um, there's a lot to pay attention to here. We also must mention the states. Um, we're seeing the states, um, state attorneys get much more involved um, in payments cases. The same types of cases we're seeing the FTC do. Um, some of you may remember if we were we talked for a couple years ago about an FTC case against Card Ready was the processor there, but um, the state of Florida had gone in on that case with the FTC and. Um, Florida law has a very specific provision prohibiting illegal credit card factoring. So that was um, a claim there made by the state of Florida against the processor in that case. Um, just yesterday, uh, we had a case that was um, a settlement announced jointly by the Federal Trade Commission and the state of Ohio. Um, and there, um, we can talk a, a little bit more about that case uh, later, but in that case, um, there are alleged um, violations of the Ohio Consumer Sales Practices Act made by the state of Ohio against the processor for being a supplier to um, merchants in the industry who were allegedly engaged in unfair and deceptive telemarketing practices. So, again, a lot of different uh, channels to think through here in this zone. Thanks. And, and Len, kind of building on that, what are some of the kind of specific theories that um, the government tends to bring against processors in these types of cases? You know, what, what are they alleging? Len, are you there? Len. Is that better? Sorry. Yeah, yes. we got you. We got you. So, Len, the question was just, okay. yeah, if you can yeah, give I, us a little I'm, more. I'm good. Sorry. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, the FTC, unlike many federal agencies, does not have direct aiding and abetting authority. So the FTC, um, even though they're essentially they're alleging that the processor has aided and abetted uh, illegal conduct, has to be a little more creative. They use their unfairness authority, and what they allege is that the uh, processor, by processing transactions, has caused substantial injury to consumers that consumers themselves cannot avoid, 
and that that injury is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. And and it essentially is akin to um, a a negligence standard. And, um, you know, one of the questions that 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 standard begs is, well, consumers can avoid, couldn't a consumer institute a chargeback or a refund? And courts have been a little reluctant to find that uh, the failure of consumers to institute chargebacks or refunds is is, uh, insufficient to, to... defeat uh, a, a claim under the unfairness, but there hasn't been a lot of litigation and that's a frequent issue. A lot of the conduct that the FTC challenges involves telemarketing and the FTC has enhanced authority for telemarketing under the telemarketing sales rule. The telemarketing sales rule does have uh, essentially aiding and abetting authority. They call it assisting and facilitating and there uh, someone can be held responsible for assisting and facilitating a telemarketing violation if they know or consciously avoid knowing that um, the party that they're doing business with is is violating another part of the telemarketing sales rule. The FTC is very focused, as are the states, on credit card laundering, whether that's using um, multiple merchant accounts to sort of hide or diffuse uh, merchant activity using someone else's merchant account if the primary merchant can't get a, uh, a merchant account. So the FTC has challenged that conduct under a specific provision in the telemarketing sales rule that outlaws credit card factoring. And they've also challenged that particular conduct uh, under their unfairness authority. The CFPB has assisting and facilitating uh, authority as well as unfairness authority generally, and they've used those provisions in, in challenging payment processor conduct as well. Got it. Um, So now I'd like to maybe switch to talking about, you know, some of the getting a little bit more into the weeds on some of the risks that that payments companies face in light of these different enforcement um, actions and authorities that are out there. Um, And Ellen, you'd mentioned something earlier when you're talking about about how, you know, some of these banks or processors may have received, um, you know, civil investigative demands. How do these investigations of payments companies get started? You know, kind of what, what's the process going from, you know, the beginning to the end? How does this all work? Great question. Um, they really usually get started because of the activity of the merchants. So um, merchants are out there. They're, they're consumer-facing. They have a public reputation and a public profile. And if they're engaged in um, business conduct, um, it could either be the sales of, of products, um, the making of uh, products claims that are too good to be true, or even the way that they're selling things. If it's, for example, a um, something sold on a free trial basis with a recurring subscription program following it, uh, those types of things are, you know, if they're not done in compliance with the laws and if they're not done very carefully and transparently to consumers, drive a lot of complaints. And... Um, it's pretty routine now for the FTC and other regulators to ask a merchant, if they're investigating the merchant, who's your payment processor? Or sometimes to figure out who the payment processor is um, and go around the merchant and go to the payment processor first to get all sorts of information about um, the sales volume process, refund and chargeback rates. Um, they'll ask for the merchant file. Um, and so as a processor or an, or an ISO or, or even a bank, um, the bank can receive these requests from the FTC as, as much as anybody else, even if the FTC has no law enforcement jurisdiction in the bank. But um, the processing entities end up turning over all this information. Um, a lot of times the FTC will pursue its case against the merchant, and then sometimes it will amend a complaint against the merchant and add the payment processor as a defendant. And then sometimes the FTC might separately, um, even if the merchants, the underlying merchant case has been wrapped up, the FTC might go ahead and file a separate action against the processor. Um, Usually the action is is preceded by what can be a very lengthy investigation where the FTC has now come back to you. They've brought in their uh, requests and are asking for things that is not just, you know, information about what the merchant processed and did, but what were your policies, what was your underwriting like, who underwrote the account, uh, who is the sales agent that boarded it to you, and they will um, look at all these and determine if uh, 
if they think that you have violated the law. And if so, they'll ask you usually if you want to settle um, and you can have the choice to settle or, or litigate and fight. So I guess picking up on that then, um, Len, if you've got a client that's being investigated, um, you know, what are the, what are the potential uh, penalties um, or, you know, injunctive provisions or kind of what are the, what's the loss and ramifications that a, a client can be facing um, in connection with, with one of these types of investigations? Sorry, the FDA right now is very, very focus, focused on deterrence, and that's both specific deterrence and general deterrence. So when they're going after payment processors, in most cases, they are seeking the, to hold the payment processor jointly and severally liable for the full amount of uncompensated consumer loss. So let's say the, the merchant costs allegedly $100 million in consumer loss, and uh, as Ellen said, they, they settled with the, the merchant, and the merchant only had $10 million. bucks. So there's $90 million that the FTC thinks consumers ought to get back. The FTC will look to the processor and seek to hold the processor fully responsible for the full volume that it processed. Not the fees that the processor earned or not the profit on those fees, but the full amount of the volume processed. And there was a case in the 11th Circuit about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that affirmed the court's ability to award the FTC that kind of relief. That, that, that issue is percolating in some other cases. The court doesn't have to do that. It has the power to do that. But that is um, certainly the, the FTC's starting point. To the extent that the FTC is seeking violations uh, of the TSR, it could uh, alternatively seek uh, civil penalties, but typically it, it goes for you know, equitable monetary relief in the amount of full consumer loss. And there's also um, you know, reputational risks. You know, your bank may be scared by the fact that you have now been named in an FTC suit, and one of the things the government likes to do is to try and get the bank and the processor or the ISO, get all the parties in the chain, uh, pointing their finger at each other uh, and essentially making the government's case for it. As Ellen mentioned, the, the FTC does not have jurisdiction over banks chartered in the United States, but the FTC in the last two years has sued two different banks that were chartered overseas um, who do not enjoy the same exemption from FTC jurisdiction uh, on the same kinds of theories that it sues payment processors for, you know, unfairness and assisting and facilitating uh, you know, alleged deceptive and, and fraudulent conduct towards merchants. Uh, they, the litigation can also spur piggyback class action suits. Um, and, you know, one of the other issues that, the, and we'll talk more about this later, that the frequent source subject between processors and the FTC is, um, you know, as Ellen alluded to, many times the FTC goes to court and gets an asset freeze, and that freezes all of the monies that are held for the benefit of the merchant. There's been a lot of controversy and dispute about whether reserves are the property of the merchant or the property of the processor, and if they're the property of the merchant, whether they ought to be turned over. Um, one could observe that fighting vociferously with the FTC about that issue is certainly one way to uh, make sure you're very high on the FTC's radar. And again, you know, for every time the FTC sends a CID out to a merchant or begins an investigation of a merchant, they track who that merchant's processors are. So as a processor, if, if you're responding to a lot of CIDs, a lot of subpoenas, you, you, you want to keep track of that. And you want to think about why that is and perhaps take some steps to, to remediate that. Because if you're not keeping track of it, I can assure you that the FTC, the states, and the CFPB are. Great. Um, and Len, maybe just sticking on that briefly before we shift into talking about some of the more recent enforcement actions, just kind of, you know, off the top of your head, what are some of the um, types of processor conduct or, or payments company conduct, like the red flags that, that really tend to um, lead to these types of investigations or lead to, the, you know, the liability in the event that, that you're unable to get an investigation closed? Sure. And, and processor misconduct, I'm not sure that's the right word, but I can't think of another one. It falls, I would say, under sort of two sides uh, of a divide. 
One is, is where the processor has been reckless or negligent, and, and that typically will involve not following the processor's own guidelines, both as to the initial underwriting and then follow on monitoring that should be done for a merchant. So if your underwriting guidelines say you should get three months of statements and you don't, but, yeah, that, that's going to be something the FTC is going to use. If your monitoring guidelines say that, you know, if you see chargebacks above a certain percentage for a certain period of time, you should, you know, either take remedial action or, you know, have some documentation as to why that merchant was um, kept on and, and you fail to do that, the FTC will use those failures against you. You know, it, it's, I painted it as a dichotomy. It's probably more of a continuum. The other kind of conduct that gets the um, processors or the ISOs into trouble are more really directly helping the merchant get a merchant account that the merchant account otherwise couldn't get or might lose. So that could be if a merchant is on the match list or the principal of the merchant is on the match list, helping the merchant set up um, straw men or independent business owners who um, get the merchant accounts and then essentially for the benefit of the entity that, that that's banned or has had a hard time getting merchant accounts. And spreading uh, processing volume uh, across a large number of companies so as to make sure that none of those companies gets more than 50 or so chargebacks in a month so they don't have the, the card brands program. Ignoring, as we just talked about a second, ignoring subpoenas, CIDs from law enforcement, not taking any steps to say, gee, why, why do I keep getting uh, subpoenas for this merchant? Same, same for questions from banks and other financial institutions. And one of the recurring themes that you see in, in FTC cases and CFPB cases and state cases is that a merchant has some concerns about uh, sorry, a processor has some concerns about a merchant. In response, the processor substantially increases its reserves to protect itself against financial loss, but but doesn't do anything to. Um, address the root of the problem to talk to the merchant about why your chargebacks are so high, why your refunds are so high, why um, your BBB rating is, is so poor. And the FTC will paint that as evidence that you knew something was wrong, but you worried about yourself and turned a blind eye to alleged consumer injury. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. Um, and I think that's, you know, now is a good time to maybe transition to talking about some actual um, you know, concrete enforcement actions. I think, you know, that, that really, the, Ellen and Len, you've set the stage in terms of, of giving us good background on how these cases come about, what are some of the legal theories, what are some of the risks, et cetera. Um, and I think that, you know, for the attendees that have been going to MAC events in the past, you know, these are, they're probably pretty familiar with a lot of those, a lot of those concepts because um, this isn't something that is new. Uh, you know, the FTC in particular, as well as some of the other uh, federal uh, regulatory agencies have been bringing these types of cases, you know, for more than, you know, up to 10 years, uh, really. Um, and oftentimes it's uh, to the tune of about three to five uh, cases a year, it, it seems like. And we've already got um, three really so far um, this year. So um, I think this is a great way to transition to talking a little bit more about some of these specific cases. Um, and Ellen, I think maybe, um, could you walk us through, we'll start with uh, the FTC's recent case involving uh, First Data Merchant Services. It'd be great if you could, you know, walk us through what this case was about, um, you know, what were the ramifications from it in terms of the, the impact, and then, you know, what were some of the injunctive provisions that are coming out of this settlement agreement that may be uh, new or unique? Sure thing. And um, actually, Len and I are going to tag team this one a little bit, but, um, a couple quick points. Um, Len was mentioning things that um, tactics that can be used to sort of evade uh, scrutiny and risk, like the shell company setting up shell companies and, and um, multiple processing accounts. We had a panel yesterday that did a really great job um, talking about some risk and underwriting management um, strategies and tools to avoid some of that. So um, tune into that and get the recording for that um, if you weren't able to listen in. And then, um, you know, and also I think we're at um, five cases actually already this year. Um, there was one in January announced, um, and I'm going by the date that they're announced, but, 
you know, and of course they, they cases take a long time to be in, pro, in process, but one against Transact Pro in January. Um, um, and then I think it was Revenue Wire uh, a couple months ago. Um, we've all been talking about the first data case, which is where we're gonna spend a lot of time. I mentioned that Ohio FTC case, which was against Madeira Merchant Services, um, a case last week involving QualPay, um, and there's been many in the past. So, um, you know, they, they, there's some common patterns and things like that. Um, but again, I think we'll start with the, spend the most time on the first data case, just because it's, um, you know, it, it hit the industry with a pretty big impact. Um, and uh, Len, why don't, do you, Len, can I turn it over to you to sort of get through the, the facts and the allegations and uh, start there? Sure, happy to do that. And one of the things that's it's remarkable about uh, the uh, first data case is the age of the underlying conduct. The conduct um, that the merchants engaged in was old, I mean, four, five, six years old. And, and there's some questions about, you know, statutes of limitations that might apply to FTC actions or um, whether after the Third Circuit's opinion in Shire, the, the FTC can really go after conduct that's over. But, um, you know, there may have been tolling agreements here. There may have been uh, an aversion to, you know, wanting to uh, test those uh, legal theories in a uh, in court. But, you know, the, the, the conduct was really old, like 2012 to 2014. So, don't take uh, comfort in the fact that you haven't heard from the FTC, even though, you know, they sued a merchant some time ago. It, it, it sometimes takes them a while to get around to uh, to you. Um, the, the verticals involved here are ones that will be familiar, business coaching, and there the, the alleged uh, conduct generated combined chargeback and refund rates of, you know, 27 to 36%. Um, but the, the allegation was that the uh, you know, conduct continued. And one of the big issues here is that the merchant was uh, brought in through a wholesale ISO who, you know, at least in first data's view, was supposed to be handling the uh, underwriting and monitoring. The FTC's view is you're, you're compensating them for that. They are your agent and you are responsible um, for that. One of the other merchants was a uh, in the nutraceutical dietary supplement space, um, and they were banned by Visa. Um, nevertheless, uh, First Data and, and the ISO figured out a way to sort of you know work around that that ban, um, and th there was a lot in the way of uh, email traffic internally and and with the ISO that. Um, indicated that, you know, first data may be, you know, turning a blind eye to concerns raised by the bank uh, and, and others. Um, the uh, FTC, when it sued, not only sued first data, but it, it did sue um, the gentleman, Mr. Coe, who, who was the uh, former principal of the ISO and later came to, to work for First Data. So I think the fact that uh, First Data essentially bought the assets there and then ultimately brought Mr. Coe in made it difficult for the uh, processor to distance itself f from the, the alleged conduct of the, uh, you know, the, the ISO and claimed that it was all, all their fault. The FTC used the same claims that we've been talking about, you know, unfairness for payment processing, credit card laundering, uh, assisting and facilitating such laundering, and uh, assisting and facilitating the alleged deceptive rep uh, representations. Uh, Ellen can now tell you sort of what all of that led to by way of a settlement. So... Yeah. This. Yeah. So the settlement, uh, and we're going to. There were two settlements. One with First Data, and then one with uh, Vincent Co. We're going to spend time on the First Data part of things, but um, you know, understand that settlements are heavily negotiated, and and this is you know, whereas it's very difficult 
maybe even impossible to negotiate what the FTC might write in its complaints and the allegations it may make. It may make. That's a very one-sided story. Um, settlements, you know, if you're choosing to settle, you are uh, trying, of course, to, you know, to come up with something that is doable and fair and settlements usually include components of money and components of injunctive relief conduct prohibitions or restrictions that must be followed and in first data's case it was an agreement to pay 40 million dollars um that was probably some number based on some sales volume maybe negotiated in some way um but the injunctive relief is something that we're going to talk about um it's interesting in this case because um very detailed order with a lot of requirements a lot of detailed um, requirements for screening and monitoring um, investigating um, certain things that might happen certain chargeback triggers or thresholds that are hit but it's for on a very narrow basis so here um, it's really just applying to those conduct uh, requirements applying to home-based internet business programs, debt consolidation services, and sellers of nutraceutical products with a negative option feature, like the free trial subscription stuff, that are boarded by wholesale ISOs. And so, again, three types of merchants boarded by a wholesale ISO. Um, here, as the FTC defined wholesale ISO, it's what you would probably expect, but it's a it, it's a it's an ISO that's entered into an agreement with the processor and the bank. The ISO holds contractual liability um, to the bank and the processor for credit and fraud losses, and it's got um, the ISO has primary contractual responsibility for underwriting and and monitoring merchant transactions. Um, specifically, does not include uh, registered payment facilitators. Um, but I think this order is really starting to show a lot of concern about ISO programs. Um, as Len was saying earlier, who is responsible for doing this stuff? Um, and is it okay to even contractually require a wholesale ISO to do things like underwriting and monitoring and just let them do it? And, uh, you know, how much do you have to uh, really oversee what they're doing? So I, I think this suggests really paying perhaps paying some more attention there, getting a little bit more involved may be necessary to try to avoid uh, finding yourself in these types of situations. So um, in the order, as I mentioned, there are some screening requirements, screening requirements for those very specific types of covered merchants, um, um, which would include things like the usual stuff, I would say. And this is usual in the sense that we see it in FTC orders all the time, but it's also stuff that if you're a processor and I said, you probably already do this, but um, reviewing the principles of the business and controlling persons and um, the business information, what are they doing? What are they selling? Past processing uh, statements, um, bank references, other information like that, and just sort of confirming all of that information. Um, on the monitoring side, reviewing the merchant's website, um, you know, periodically, maybe even frequently. Um, the FTC always puts in the requirement that it must be from an IP address that isn't associated with the processor. So the merchant can somehow, you know, change their, their page or, or put, put a dummy site up. Um, monitoring chargeback and return rates. Um, there are certain tr uh, triggers for when the processor here for, for state in this case would actually have to launch an internal investigation of the merchant. Um, so that would be when the um, for chargebacks when they uh, the merchant hits one percent in a month with a total count or number count of chargebacks exceeding seventy five, um, that would require sort of stopping transaction processing and trying to figure out if this merchant is engaged in conduct that is violating um, consumer protection laws. So um, the unique thing then even more unique um, here is that on the monitoring of the merchants and doing this investigation and writing this report, that report actually has to go to now a third party assessor as the FTC has defined it. And this is the first case that we know of where the FTC has imposed an, an assessor to come in um, you know, and work with the payment processor. Of course, 
for this. This has to be somebody experienced in the business with, um, you know, experience doing something like a Visa Guards review or a MasterCard assessments and sort of follow these, read these reports, um, you know, make sure the first data has come up with the right conclusions, um, potentially turn these reports over to the FTC, work with the FTC very carefully. So it's a, it's pretty intrusive in that way um, as well. So, um, and then other things in the order, um, there are requirements for establishing a wholesale ISO oversight program. Again, going back to the point where oversight is, um, ISO oversight is becoming very, very important. So that's gonna entail performing a risk assessment for each ISO um, methodologies for assessing the risk, um, risk ratings and things like that, that, that would get modified over time, depending on what's going on. Um, policies and procedures for overseeing the ISOs and then policies and procedures for overseeing the policies and procedures of the ISOs that, that you have to have the ISOs um, you know, get into. So, you know, lots to be set up here, monthly risk reviews, um, re reviews of the um, ISO portfolio when it hurt, hits um, certain thresholds there, 0.75% chargebacks with 75 uh, count per month types of things there again, and um, just all sorts of risk assessments and assigning levels of risk. And then uh, there again, the third party assessor is going to be kind of walking step by step to make sure that everything here is in place, it's operating smoothly, first data is following it. Um, if there's any gaps or weaknesses in the program, first data is putting in uh, appropriate remediation and those types of things. So um, lots to really unpack here. Here and it's worth a read and worth maybe taking a look at what you're doing uh, to see if you need to come up to these standards if you're not there already. Great. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to switch um, to the next enforcement action. But um, before we do that, I'd like to give the um, CLE code um, word for today, which is uh, scrutiny 2020. That's scrutiny. 2020 is your CLE credit code word. Um, so with that, Len, um, I think we're ready to transition over to discussing uh, the other recent, in fact, very recent uh, FTC enforcement action, which is one against uh, or involving uh, QualPay. So Len, could you maybe walk us through uh, some of the details of that? Sure, happy to do that. Um, QualPay arose out of the FTC's action against a company called My Online Business Education, or MOBE. Uh, the FTC sued that entity in, in 2018 and subsequently filed some uh, follow-on actions against persons and, and entities that were uh, affiliate marketers for MOBE. Uh, the alleged conduct involves what the FTC would call a get-rich-quick scheme about how to make money selling goods or services on Amazon. Um, QualPay uh, ultimately settled for, for $80 million, but that, that was uh, essentially suspended based on, on QualPay's inability to pay. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, QualPay was in a battle with the FTC over the reserves, heavily litigated. Uh, there were appeals noted and, and lots of back and forth. And uh, you know, the, the FTC, in um, trying to reclaim those reserves, was arguing that you know, QualPay's unclean hands in some way uh, blocked any claim it might have. And, and those claims ultimately arose into a, a separate action against um, QualPay. As to the red flags that the FTC pointed to in, in its complaint, they pointed to seven other different processors refusing to do business with Mo before QualPay agreed. Um, they pointed to QualPay not following its own underwriting guidelines requiring it to vet completely. Uh, merchant applications that had even a single high-risk characteristic. Uh, the uh, business opportunity continuity program and how-to seminar coaching services were all 
uh, what Moog did, and those were all high-risk triggers under QualPay's uh, underwriting guidelines, but uh, QualPay didn't do the requisite underwriting its own guidelines required for a high-risk merchant. There were lots of merchant applications for uh, Moog, but they, they varied considerably, which the FTC took to be a red flag, for instance. One sales agent requested a single account that would uh, cover $56 million in annual sales, representing supposedly the, the, the total sales of the enterprise. But um, another uh, sales agent submitted applications for several different accounts that listed the total annual volume as only $5 million. So those discrepancies the FTC took to the evidence of uh, you know, either very sloppy underwriting or you know, deliberate blindness as to what was going on here. Uh, there was a recurring theme that, that QualPay just didn't seem to understand the, the business that it was processing for. And, uh, you know, that, that's obviously uh, a problem when you've got know your customer obligations that banks impose on processors and the FTC seeks to impose. Enormous numbers of chargebacks um, in, in the thousands. One of the things that uh, QualPay uh, looked at was, uh, as it used, was a, a chargeback mitigation service. And the FTC paints that service in a sinister way, saying that chargebacks would have been much higher but for the use of those services. Um, the FTC doesn't mention that. Visa and MasterCard purchase companies that do that in the last several years, and that's a legitimate service. But the FTC clearly is, I think, concerned about chargeback mitigation, chargeback challenging services, and I, I think you'll see some more enforcement there. Um, you know, again, repeated examples of just not understanding uh, what the, was going on and not following the, own, the the company's own underwriting guidelines. No would terminate certain of qual uh, I'm sorry qualify would terminate certain of modes accounts but not, but not others and didn't uh, um, report any of those closed accounts which were closed due to chargeback activity uh, to the match list which the FTC took issue with and, and then d despite um, everything that was going on uh, qualpay continued to, to process for mode up to the day that the FTC froze mode's assets. Um, and the FTC points out that MOB was a significant part, above 8% of the, the QualPay portfolio, and alleges that that uh, significant revenue contribution clouded QualPay's judgment. W one interesting thing is that um, unlike a lot of the uh, recent settlements here, uh, the, the principal of or the principles of, of QualPay were not named. Uh, now, uh, that, that may be because they didn't make a lot of money out of the business. That may be because that was just sort of what it took to get a deal done. But the FTC generally has been very uh, adamant that, that individuals have to be named to have the requisite deterrent effect. But um, QualPay really got wiped out based when it lost the reserves and the number of chargebacks it had to fund and everything else. And it may be that somebody at the FTC decided they had and their owners and principals ha had suffered enough. Um, Ellen, do you want to talk about the order, or I can do that? Sorry, I was on mute. Go ahead, Len. I, you can talk about the order. Yeah. So the, the, the order is, um, you know, there's just one count of unfairness, and the order is actually pretty simple. It, it bans Quape from processing the future for companies in the business coaching space. It bans Quape from, <laughs> excuse me, processing for anybody that's been on the match list or where the principals have been on the match list. And that, that uh, provision that uh, bans a, a processor from processing for, for individuals or companies on the match list is one you're, you're seeing in more and more FTC orders. It has screening and monitoring provisions for high-risk clients, uh, high-risk clients being defined as you know, card not present transactions that sell or promote continuity programs with negative option features, scholarship finding services, stored value cards, outbound telemarketing, credit restoration, debt consolidation, extended warranty programs, government grants, and mortgage loan modifications. The 
underwriting and monitoring provisions are, are similar to what we, we saw in the first data case. The, the chargeback threshold that requires sort of a enhanced due diligence in the monitoring side was 1% and, and 50 chargebacks in it for two of the last six months. Uh, again, similar to what you see in first data and you know, the, the requirement that if you're going to keep someone who hits those thresholds, you really, you've got to sort of the burdens on the company to write a report that, that explains clearly and convincingly why that merchant is being kept. Great. Um, so I think ending on that list of, of some of the higher risk um, clients or types of customers identified in that settlement order is a good way to transition to talking uh, about what we see as some of the kind of hot topics or areas uh, for potential government scrutiny in terms of, you know, some of the industry verticals maybe uh, that might be getting some more uh, scrutiny uh, today and in the, in the coming years. And I think one of the points that you made, I think, Len, earlier about the, uh, the first data matter is that, um, you know, what you're doing today may lead to an enforcement action relatively soon, or it could be several years from now uh, by the time the FTC gets around to identifying the underlying merchant and then being able to bring a case. So um, what you are doing today can have long-term um, ramifications. So um, Len, maybe to stick with you on this, given our current circumstances, uh, I think the obvious place to start would be, you know, with COVID and um, what are some of the risks uh, for processing uh, processors in the payments industry when it comes to uh, merchants uh, in involved in COVID-related type products or services? Sure. So the FTC, as you would expect, has been very, very active in trying to stop uh, conduct that they believe is harming consumers using the fear, paranoia, uh, desperation of people who are either um, suffering from COVID, being negatively affected by the economic downturn caused by COVID, or, or just scared about either of those things. So there have been, um, the FTC has filed, I think, one lawsuit so far uh, seeking to stop COVID claims, but they, they have sent hundreds, literally hundreds of warning letters. And the areas where the FTC are concerned are claims that products will prevent or cure or ameliorate in, in some way uh, the COVID disease, claims that people who are stuck at home and perhaps out of a job can make money, perhaps making lots of money uh, through work at home uh, schemes, similar to what we just talked about, MOBE, you know, multi-level marketing, things uh, of that nature. And the other area are things that are promising people that they can help those people get government benefits and those uh, benefits are illusory or they're charging people lots of money with, to get a benefit that people, perhaps even a small business, might be able to get um, for, for, for no cost and not really providing value. Um, th those are the areas that the um, FTC appears to be most focused on. The states are focused on them as well. Uh, the states are also very focused on the Justice Department on price gouging. Um, but, uh, you know, you, the FTC sends out pre uh, press releases when they send out these letters, and there's a list of the companies that are receiving the warning letters. And, you know, I think it's important, whatever – tools you use to make sure that somebody is monitoring those press releases or that those releases are being scanned by whatever tools you use for you know, business intelligence. And, you know, if uh, one of your merchants is getting one of those letters, I think you've got to have a serious discussion with the merchant about what they're doing to address the issues raised by the FTC, because if they don't address them, they will get sued. That's, that's pretty clear. Um, yeah. And I think, um, Another area to keep in mind um, that is likely to get a lot of scrutiny, and this, this definitely comes out of uh, what we saw coming out of the last, last financial uh, crisis and has continued to be a focus, are um, uh, merchants or financial services providers that are perceived as, as either providing you know, riskier financial services or financial services that are um, targeted more to uh, vulnerable uh, consumers, right? 
um, whether we're talking about lending, um, you know, credit repair, uh, credit card protection, products and services, identity theft uh, protection. You know, I, we're facing uncertain and, and, and some difficult economic um, times right now. And so um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the regulators will, will likely stay focused um, on some of these services that maybe are targeting some of these more vulnerable uh, populations. Um, so I think that's something to, to keep an eye on. Um, also, just very quickly to talk about uh, CBD, because that's another topic that, that we definitely see a lot of interest in, but I think remains a, a complicated and therefore a riskier um, area for uh, the processing industry. I think, you know, as, as most people know by now, um, the 2018 Farm Bill removed um, what is defined as hemp from the Controlled Substances Act, so it's no longer defined as, as marijuana that, that is, you know, inherently illegal under uh, federal law. But it also established a regulatory framework that goes along with that, where states have to come up with uh, regulatory plans for regulating hemp and products that are derived from hemp, uh, such as CBD that comes from hemp. Um, and a lot of states have gotten those plans approved and, and are moving forward. Um, but that's really just the start of, of kind of the, dealing with the issues for, for something like CBD. You know, first of all, if you're dealing with a CBD or a hemp merchant, how do you know that it's not actually a product that was derived from marijuana based on the, the THC content it has and isn't, in fact, you know, hemp or, or CBD from hemp? Um, and then from there, there's still a robust um, food and drug-related uh, federal legal, uh, regulatory a framework that, that basically makes it impermissible for CBD to be in food or dietary supplements. And then there's just your standard uh, federal and state laws and regulations that govern uh, marketing, you know, uh, unfair and deceptive claims. If you're, if you're marketing CBD as being able to cure some type of disease when, when that isn't the case. So um, I think from, you know, from our perspective, you know, providing processing services to the hemp or CBD industry is one that has to be done carefully and kind of thoughtfully in terms of understanding the, the products and services, the types of customers uh, that you're dealing with um, as well. Um, so that, that, that's one area that I think there's a lot of interest in, but it also needs to, to have an eye kept on. A um, lot, lot of focus on small businesses as well, um, which probably strikes some as unusual when you think about the FTC. Len, I don't know, do you have, do you have just a minute or two to, to quickly talk about what the FTC has been doing recently in terms of looking at small businesses and protecting them? Sure. So the FTC is more focused on small businesses than at any time I, I can remember. They held a forum to discuss issues with small business lending and, and clearly take a broad view of their authority there. They brought a case in Atlanta uh, early this year against a company called Fleet Corps that leases fleets of vehicles and uh, auxiliary products for managing those fleets. So, I mean, these are not necessarily small businesses that are purchasing those uh, services or certainly businesses that are, are you know, sophisticated. The, the FTC takes a very broad view of who a consumer is for purposes of its jurisdiction. And um, they actually refuse to define it. If you like are trying to you're trying to sell a case of them and trying to limit you know who a consumer is under that order, that they, they will refuse to, to uh, put in writing any any definition because they want that wiggle room. But uh, just because a merchant uh, caters to, to businesses is uh, something is, is not does not protect you. And I think you know the extent that uh, processors. Uh, are, are dealing with uh, merchants and, and, you know, leasing equipment or, or other things. You know, I think that's something the FTC would think was also within its jurisdiction. Got it. Um, and then, Ellen, from your perspective, what would you kind of highlight for the audience as some higher risk uh, areas to keep in mind? Um, you know, I think uh, I think we've covered them. I think they're in the FTC orders. Um, um, anything that hits the, the pocketbooks of um, consumers is always sort of in there. The, the number one thing I think that's really on my mind, and um, those of you who, who work with me know that I've been sort of now really harping on this, but it is sort of the, um, the ISO and sub-agent monitoring. And even just looking back at the first data case again, um, there there is the ISO that we talked about, Vincent Coe and his company, but then there is a whole bunch of sub-ISOs under them. And 
you know, there are allegations in the complaint that those sub ISOs weren't properly underwritten. A lot of them had pro past uh, issues with fraud and, and other problems that, you know, were problematic and should have been spotted and maybe they shouldn't have been allowed to be side by sub ISOs. And then when you look at sometimes literally hundreds of shell companies being opened up and merchant accounts for all of these shells companies being established, the applications are all listed under the name of the same sales agent or sub ISO. So really paying attention to the, like that, I don't know if it's the upline or the downline, but that, that chain that they're going, look, looking deep down um, and really digging a lot deeper is like the thing that I would really start to focus on now because we've had too many warnings now from the FTC not to do it. Makes sense. Um, all right, well, we have just a few minutes left and I think it's worth uh, maybe ending with some concluding thoughts uh, from each of us on how to manage some of this risk. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and maybe just kick it off at, at a very high level, just you know, talking about the concept of compliance management and how it's critical for payments companies, really regardless of your size um, or the nature of your portfolio or, or your activities to, to take compliance seriously. Um, and it really starts with having kind of a formal compliance management process where you have policies, procedures, and controls in place. You've done a risk assessment to understand what your risks are and, and what kind of controls you need to address those risks. And then making sure that you've got um, uh, the right team in terms of hiring and training your staff in place and having um, a compliance officer or at least some other uh, senior management if, if you're a smaller entity that has responsibility over compliance and, and the team that's working there. Um, and, and from there, kind of just taking a, an enterprise-wide um, approach to, to managing your legal and regulatory compliance. That's, that's really the framework. But again, um, you have to go deeper than that. Ellen, um, we only have a, a few minutes, but in terms of kind of some of the underwriting and due diligence, what's, you know, one or two lessons that the audience can take away? Yeah, I think if you're seeing signs that the merchant is engaged in unfair or deceptive conduct and there are potential problem for you, as soon as you really are sure about that, you've got to take some action. And, and depending on the circumstances, maybe you can try to remediate with the merchant in some way. But honestly, that this is the biggest thing now, too, in the cases is that it's so easy to put an allegation in that the signs were there. Um, nonetheless, we turned the other way, kept processing, let it happen again. Um, and if only we had terminated, you know, when we first saw these signs, that, that could that could really save you in, in some of these cases. So just really paying attention and not being tempted to keep the, the merchant there when they shouldn't be there just because they're very profitable. Yeah. And Len, uh, I guess I would flip it to you maybe for the last comment here from a, a compliance and risk management perspective, what would be um, your suggested takeaway for the audience? Well, underwriting is obviously important up front. It's the monitoring going on. I don't think any company will get sued just for poor underwriting. It's the monitoring. If the merchant, you and the merchant have discussions, and the merchant says, well, here's what we're going to do to mitigate, we're going to change these things, you know, there has to be some follow-up, just sort of papering the file with, well, the merchant said they were going to institute a chargeback reduction plan, and they're going to be more generous with refunds, and they've tempered some of their advertising, you know, just saying that the, just repeating that the merchants said they're going to do those things it, it isn't sufficient. Um, you know, there, there's got to be ongoing due diligence. You've probably got a secret shop. You've got to do that from a computer that the merchant doesn't know um, is, is you. You know, the, the, the more signs that you see, I think, you know, the higher your burden is to keep that merchant. And, you know, at a certain point, you've got to decide, is this really worth it? And, I, you know, obviously, in hindsight, you're going to say no if you get sued. But, um, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I, I, that's really true in, in today's environment. Yeah. Uh, great. And and I just want to add one more thought um, that, that I had. And I, that just goes back to what you guys were discussing on the first uh, data FTC and this, this wholesale ISO oversight program. You know, that, that kind of third-party vendor management and oversight has obviously been a big issue uh, and obligation in the banking world for a long time. I think we've seen a lot of those concepts start to work their way more into the payments world as well, um, even stepping away from the bank side. And so I think that's an interesting change and um, we'll have to see how some of that kind of third party oversight uh, maybe evolves 
um, in light of that uh, agreement. So anyway, um, that brings us to the end. Um, I'd like to thank again, uh, Mac, for helping to co-host this with Venable, uh, Ellen and Len for providing great um, content and discussion during this presentation. Uh, remind everybody that we'll have another webinar tomorrow at the same time, that's uh, one o'clock Eastern, where we'll have, uh, we'll be discussing uh, international issues with um, speakers from the US, Canada and UK to discuss their uh, regulatory frameworks. And then on Friday, we'll have our final one on what's next in payment. So with that, uh, thank you very much to everyone and have a good rest of the day. Thank you all.